Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Q&A about history of science and technology. I'm happy to talk about both things I've been involved in and other kinds of history that I might happen to know about. You know, I am right now uh, submerged in a crazy history project because I've done some work on the second law of thermodynamics, um, which is a 150-year-old thing. I think I mentioned this before. I really managed to make I think some pretty nice progress that lets one understand a bunch of things that uh, is made possible now by things that have come out of our physics project. But I myself have been interested in the second order of thermodynamics basically since I was 12 years old, which is like 50 something years ago. And um, uh, I've been trying to now, as part of writing up what I've done and understanding the second law of thermodynamics recently, I decided I should write kind of the arc of the whole story, 50 year story of my uh, involvement with the second law of thermodynamics. And it's interesting. I mean, history is hard. Uh, you know, this is self history. So, you know, sort of I've lived all these pieces. And yet, what I realize as I try to write that history is that there are many connections which sort of on the ground at the moment I did not understand. And only decades later can you sort of fit, fit those threads together and see why one, it was sort of obvious one went from here to there. The thing that's also notable to me about this history is there are sort of long periods where not a lot seemed to happen. And then moments where in just a couple of days, having discovered something, I could work out its consequences because I kind of knew the context and it was sort of immediately things unrolled. And uh, that's the case on um, uh, May 26th to June 1st, 1984, was uh, a big sort of uh, flurry of discovery around Rule 30, um, which I think I may have mentioned this before. I, I, I now have tracked this down. You know, I first made a Rule 30 uh, and even included in a paper in 1982, in early 1982. But I included it essentially without comment. Like, I didn't really internalize this phenomenon that you can have such a simple rule, simple initial conditions, complicated behavior. It took me two more years to internalize that. But once I got to it, I had figured out things like computational irreducibility very quickly thereafter, because I had sort of precursors of that from studying complicated initial conditions. But, you know, the process that I've been doing, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now up to 1986 in my attempt to kind of trace down this history. And it's sort of, you know, how does one really do this? Well, I have good archives. They're reasonably organized, but not perfectly organized. Some of the issues are um, that there are documents which are undated, where it's hard to know what order they go in. I don't have my archives organized. I don't have a purely chronological organization of my archives. And I, I, that's something we're, we're trying to build some, some technology and software for doing archive work. And one of the things I want to try to do is have something where using whatever heuristics we can and whatever actual dates uh, are available um, to actually be able to get everything in the archive organized chronologically. Um, that would be quite useful to see. But, you know, for me, uh, it turns out even in the 80s, I was doing sort of multi, I led a multi-threaded life where I was doing lots of different things at the same time, technology development, science, organizational kinds of things, and so on. And so it isn't the case that there's sort of a single block of when, oh, this was happening, then this was happening. It's all interwoven with other, but with other things. I mean, for example, I have my calendars from 1983, 84, 85, et cetera. And I've been spending, I've had to go back and just look, you know, what, what was I actually doing on these, on these dates? And I have all that information. Um, and, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out when did I receive this letter? Well, you know, I can figure out it was a physical letter because everything was in those days. And I was traveling those days, so I couldn't have received it then. It must have been when I got back, which was this particular date. And, you know, for example, I just found, um, uh, a FedEx something, which was a pile of documents where they'd been scanned, but they were in an envelope, but it was a FedEx envelope. So I kind of knew it had to have a FedEx air bill. And that was from 1985. I'm somewhat amused at how incredibly similar the early FedEx air bill from 1985 looks to a FedEx 
build today. But be that as it may, one thing that's useful about that is it's got a date on it. And so then one knows what when that stack of documents is from. But this question about dating things, I've also got my file systems. And often one can get a date from file systems from the uh, most recent modification date on the files. That's fine, but what if there was an earlier version of it? And um, how does one find out when was the file first created? Sometimes there are file systems that have that information. The Unix file system that um, uh, doesn't store that information, I think, at least the version of it that existed back in those days, it just stores the most recent modification date. Um, and so then uh, I have, for example, I have tapes, nine track tape, magnetic tape, uh, which, and we've read most of the tapes that I had, backup tapes that I had from the 1980s. Um, and so one can see there some of those things. There are also cases where there are um, backup manifests that were on a particular date. So one can see whether a file had been created by that date and so on. I mean, it's surprisingly complicated to, to track down sort of uh, uh, some of these threads of what happened when. Like, like, for example, the particular thing that I uh, sort of was up too late yesterday trying to figure out is in 1986, I found sort of minimal cellular automaton approximations to the diffusion equation, which is something where the things I found, I have now reused in the stuff I'm doing right now on the second law of thermodynamics. And the question is, I know that I presented those things as a poster at a conference called CA86, cellular automaton conference at MIT that I was uh, the main organizer of. Um, and uh, the um, uh, uh, and I've got sort of the the both the file raw material and the scans of the poster um, that I had. But then there was sort of how did I actually do the search for this rule? Um, I have code that could have done that search, but I haven't yet found the actual place where I did. You know, I probably searched a billion different rules. Um, I haven't found that actual search. And, and maybe there's no tangible output of it anymore. Maybe I just had a file that was, here's the things I found. Um, and you know that, that's an example of something where I'd kind of like to know how big was that search? Was it something where I had to go and use some fancy network of computers? Was it something I could just do on the single workstation class computer that I had at that time, which was then the Sun workstation? Um, it's, uh, it's I, I'm sort of trying to track those things down. And uh, anyway, th this process of doing what we might call computational history, I find it's interesting because one really has a tremendous amount of detail, uh, but sometimes one has to sort of thread things together in complicated ways, and one has to go uh, searching for things. And I, I suppose one of the things I've noticed here is that I think I'm, I'm um, uh, there's a different way you read things when you're doing things for history as when you're doing things on the ground. So there are documents that I have, sometimes from other people, sometimes letters and so on, where I'm like, yeah, I think I know what that letter said. And then I'm like, well, I'm doing history now. Let me actually read every word of this letter. And I realize, oh my gosh, I didn't read that part because I didn't really care about that part at the time. But that's relevant for piecing together the kind of historical thread. Well, okay, let's let's go to some of the questions people have here after, after that. Um, um, Blank is asking, do you think in the future people will look at our societal interest in math and science the same way we view alchemists and theologians of old? That's an interesting question. I think the alchemists and the theologians got kind of a bad rap. I think what happened is, is actually a very interesting question. Okay, in a lot of fields, there are things they can do, and there are things they cannot do. And when the things they can do are of value, but sometimes they overdrive themselves, and they end up pushing into things that they can't do. And then if that takes over the field, then they get kind of a bad reputation. So for the alchemists, there was plenty of good work that was done on what we would now call chemistry, metallurgy, things like this. But then there was the, the thing that is kind of the poster goal of the alchemists, 
of turning lead into gold that just didn't work. And there was lots of hocus pocus done under the brand of alchemy. Um, but there was also lots of perfectly sensible chemistry that was done under the brand of alchemy. And I think this is one of these cases where if it had just been, oh, we're just doing this chemistry, we're learning how to refine these ores, we're doing this kind of thing, it'd be like, that's great, alchemy is great. But alchemy overran itself by saying, we're gonna turn lead into gold. So now the question is, if you look at modern science, unfortunately, modern science is in some cases overrunning itself. It says, we can predict exactly what's gonna happen in you know, pandemic situation X, in, uh, I don't know, uh, climate situation Y, these kinds of things. It's like, we're doing science. We can predict all these things. Well, it turns out one can't. And by over by overpromising, science will end up defeating itself. Now, there's, you know, the, the collection of things that have been well achieved by science is very large, very important for the technology and engineering we've done and so on. But nevertheless, science, uh, for reasons that are uh, both of its own internal pride and for sort of the societal forces on it, it has a habit of over overpromising. And the question is, will it be the case that people will look at, for example, some of the things that people have said, we can prove it scientifically in the 21st century, in the early 21st century, and people will look at that in the future and laugh at it and say, that was just silly. Just as we say, looking at the alchemists, the idea that they could turn lead into gold was silly. Yes, I think that will probably happen. I think that uh, whether the brand of current modern mathematical science is, um, is that tainted is unclear to me. Um, I, think there's, I think that it, it's had so much mileage of positive stuff that I think the taint will not be that large, although I do think that some degree of, you know, it's been proved scientifically type thing um, will be people will just roll their eyes type thing, just like people would have said, uh, you know, at, at some moment, it, the theologians will have said, you know, it works this way because it's written that way in such and such a, a sacred book or whatever else. And there came a time in the modern times when at least some fraction of the population sort of rolls their eyes at that and says, no, it isn't true. You know, just because it says in Genesis or one can deduce from Genesis that the earth was created 6,000 years ago, you know, people then roll their eyes and say, that's not true type thing. Um, it's, uh, and so similarly, there will be things where people have said today, we've proved scientifically that X, Y, Z is true. And in the future, people will roll their eyes at that and say, how could they have said that? That was just silly because they, there was just so much they didn't understand. I think a big piece of that and, and something related to my own work is this idea of computational irreducibility, this idea that even though you might know the rules by which a system operates, knowing how that system will actually behave is something that requires an arbitrarily large amount of computation. And so to say, yes, yes, we know how these sort of microscopic pieces of transmission of some disease or something work. Therefore, we can deduce this whole thing about the whole story or, or some similar thing in, in, in medicine or biomedicine or whatever, that just because we know the rules means we can immediately deduce the whole story. That's just not true. That's a case where from within science, we know from computational irreducibility that just knowing the rules is not the whole story of working out the consequences. And I think there will be met plenty of cases where people say in the future, if they'd only really understood computational irreducibility, they wouldn't have said something that silly. They wouldn't have said, oh, we know how the rules work, therefore we can immediately deduce this result. So in, in much the same way that people might have said, uh, you know, in the past, uh, oh, uh, you know, because it's written in such and such a book that this is true, we'll just believe that even though uh, without sort of doing what we would now see as being sort of a scientific validation of that claim. Now, it's worth remembering that I think the history of, of sort of the scientific method and so on, the Baconian kind of thing, I think Francis Bacon, I think, was an advisor to Elizabeth I, if I remember correctly, and was more politician than scientist. And in his original conception of sort of, let's present this as a scientific fact, part of that original conception was, 
let's do it that way so people would argue about it. So we can just say it's science. You can prove it scientifically. You don't have to have a debate about it. Um, and I think that that's, uh, uh, you know, that story of let's be authoritative, we're scientists here, uh, you know, it, it um, uh, um, is, is something that, that existed from the very earliest days of kind of this concept of the scientific method. And that has the habit of causing science to sort of overclaim itself and that will cause trouble. So yes, I think that, um, uh, um, now, you know, uh, the, the, in terms of the view of, of, of science and mathematics from today, uh, there's plenty that will survive, there's some that will not. Uh, if we talk about theology, for example, uh, it's sort of interesting because theology, you know, starting in the 1600s, basically, was sort of overtaken by science and mathematical science in particular. Um, and people started saying, uh, well, we can, uh, we can just use science to know the answer to this. We don't use the, the kind of the intellectual structure of theology. I think one of the things that's happened with our physics project and other such things is a lot of these questions from where does the universe exist on down, so to speak, end up cutting their way all the way through what we know from the last 300 years of science back to questions which were more the, the kind of the purview of the theologians. And so some of those kinds of intellectual structures that were built at the time, some of them I think uh, you know, don't seem very convincing anymore, but there was plenty of, of deep intellectual structure that was built about sort of the logical consequences of certain kinds of assumptions, which science and the mathematical tradition had no great use for, but which now I think we have much more use for. So I think there's sort of uh, more respect is due to some of the intellectual structures built by theologians maybe 500,000 years ago than um, or more um, than, uh, than perhaps they were given after sort of the next wave of popularity came in. I mean, it's, it's like, it's hard to predict, but I can imagine a, uh, a sort of a wave of things where people say, look, you know, we've already got to the point where we're using programs to describe a lot of kinds of processes rather than equations. I can believe that there will come a point where computational irreducibility is kind of the thing that people come to associate with the next thing beyond the science we have now. I, I hate to call it, um, as I ended up calling my big book 20 years ago, a new kind of science, but that's um, uh, that's what one is really talking about there, a kind of science that is deeply informed by computational irreducibility. And I can imagine a time when that kind of science looks back on our computational irreducible science and says, those guys thought they could figure out a lot more with the sort of computationally irreducible science than they could, and they did a bunch of goofy things like the alchemists did and so on. Let's see. All right, lots of interesting questions here. Um, Well, Ala Roll asks, tell us about the history of chess computers and approaches they used before deep learning. I can say a little bit about that. I don't know it in tremendous detail. Um, the, even back, you know, the idea of clockwork automata was already in, in the 1600s. People already had sort of clockwork and, and cogs and machines and, and so on. And people started talking about making chess playing automata all the way back in those kinds of times, a sort of a clockwork automaton. I mean, famously, the Mechanical Turk, as uh, it became known, was supposed to be a chess playing machine, I guess, from the 1700s, maybe, maybe the early 1800s. That was a thing that went on tour, so to speak, as, look, there's this box, and you can play chess with it. And of course, it had a, a small statue of person inside it who was really the, the chess player doing that. And that's what led to the sort of the, the term mechanical Turk, so to speak, um, that uh, uh, is, um, uh, I, I guess, the, 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 um, uh, the, the sort of purveyor of the box was Turkish, probably. Um, so that was sort of an early non-example. Then when electronic computers came in, uh, 
people started pretty early talking about chess playing. I mean, Alan Turing talked about chess playing, a person called David Champanone, who was a, a friend of Alan Turing's um, at King's College, Cambridge. Um, and David Champanone went on to become a fairly distinguished economist. Um, but when those two were sort of in college, they were talking about building chess playing computers. And I think Turing got a certain distance in kind of specking out how you would use in those days, it was kind of electromechanical relay based computers of the kind that had really been introduced for things like telephone switching. I mean, that was the technology, the, the bombs and BOMBEs at Bletchley Park used for code breaking were originally that technology was all switching technology that had come from the, from the telephone system um, of uh, being able to just sort of switch lines to, to connect in different ways based on dialed numbers and so on. So I think then after that, the, uh, I don't know, um, let's see, I don't think I know what happened until the 70s. It wasn't that far from the, from the 1950s. So I don't think I know what happened in the 1960s with chess playing computers. Um, do I know? Uh, yes, actually I do know something about that. So, I mean, in the early kind of discussions of AI, sort of chess playing was one of the branches of what was discussed. And a big piece of sort of early 1960s so-called so artificial intelligence had to do with searching strategies and the question of sort of how do you prune the search? Because let's say you're doing chess and you say, well, what move am I going to make? What you really want to do is to enumerate many possible moves, sort of tree out these possible moves and say, if I do this, then the opponent does this, if I do that, can you go five moves out, for example, and say, what will happen if I take if I make this move? Uh, what will happen if I make that move? How do I score these different things that will be the outcomes of those different moves, et cetera? In modern times, I would talk about this as a multi-way graph. Um, in fact, I even wrote something uh, a few months ago about um, uh, multi-way graphs for games. Um, I didn't get to chess. A person at our summer school actually did do look at chess and games did a rather nice job looking at that. Um, I looked at things like tic-tac-toe, where the full game graph is only 5,000 nodes or something. For chess, the full game graph is you know 10 to the 100 nodes or, or whatever. Um, but so a lot of sort of the early thinking about, some of the early thinking about AI had to do with this idea that one's going to be searching this big space. It's the same thing with theorem proving. You're trying to prove a theorem where you go from this expression to that expression by applying axioms. And the question is, which set of axioms should you apply to get from here to there? Same thing in chemical synthesis. Even in the 1960s, there's a project at Harvard, for example, called LASA, L-H-A-S-A, which was a, um, uh, an attempt to do chemical synthesis by using this kind of search and, and, and sort of prune the search. Today, in... In automated theorem proving, that's that's what you're doing. Is you're you're doing this big branching set of possibilities, and you're finding better and better ways to prune the search. So that was a thing that was sort of part of the the AI canon in the in the early '60s, um, probably you know, through through the late '60s. So then, by the '70s, people were starting to talk about making uh, custom hardware to do chess playing because the the it just wasn't going to be, one wasn't gonna be able to get to human level by using pure software with the computers of the time. And so there was a group at MIT, um, I think Ed Fredkin was involved in, I think Richard Greenblatt was a big figure in it, um, who were trying to make a, um, a chess playing computer. And I think Ed Fredkin, friend of mine from many years, um, put up like a $100,000 prize for the first computer that can beat a grandmaster at chess. And, and the way those, those computers worked, it was always you're treeing out possibilities using heuristics to determine which branches of the tree are worth pursuing and keep going from there. So I think uh, in, and then the, um, the deep blue, deep blue, the right name? Oh my gosh. Um, the chess playing computer from the 1990s that was an IBM kind of uh, uh, R&D 
I wouldn't say publicity stunt, but um, you know, R and D um, uh, demonstration. Let's say uh, was uh, that was again using sort of classical chess playing methods not what we would now call sort of neural net based machine learning or anything like that. I think, um, uh, meanwhile, the, the sort of the, the state of the art of kind of even little pocket, you know, chess playing uh, devices got better and better. And it's all a question of how, how many moves ahead can you look effectively and how well can you score the game, the, the board positions that you get to by going by making a series of moves, how can you know? Oh, that's a total lose for White in this case, or something. How do you how do you do those scorings? So I think that's that's what kind of got one to the threshold of modern um, chess playing systems. And I don't really know in detail uh, how the modern systems work. My guess is that the main use of deep learning has to do with again this this you know which path is worth looking at. It's something I've even looked at a bit in the case of automated theorem proving. Can one use machine learning to uh, to guess which direction you should go and which is a waste of time? It's like if you're simplifying a mathematical expression, is it worth expanding this piece over here or crushing this piece over here? Or is that, oh no, that's a bad branch to go down, go down a different branch. Can you Can you machine learn what branch is worth going down? And that's, I think, the main role there. But I don't know in detail how the modern chess playing systems work. But that's a that's a little bit of outline of of, of that um, that history, such as I know it. Uh, oh wow! From Aaron here, can I talk about the history of software packaging and distribution? That's a fun one. One doesn't talk about very much. Um, you know. Okay, so there are different kinds of computers. There were mainframe computers, the size of a large room. There were uh, sort of more mini computers, which actually got called mini computers by the sometime in the late 70s, that were more the size of a big desk. And then eventually, in the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, there started to be personal computers that were, uh, you know, worked in different ways. Each of these different kinds of machines had different storage media and different ways that things were distributed. So for example, for actually, I would say that the um, uh, the sort of standard distribution medium for the the big computers, so to speak, was usually nine track magnetic tape. So these big reels of magnetic tape, you know, if you look at a 1950s movie or something that features a computer, like uh, the desk set movie that's a good model for Wolfram Alpha, so to speak, where where there's a computer that can be asked general knowledge questions. I'm pretty sure we can do all the ones in that um, uh, in that movie. Um, you know, you'll see the computer in the background. It's an IBM probably mainframe computer that has all these tapes that are going. Chick, 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 chick. You know, you, the circular tapes, and there'll be uh, two spools of tape, and you'll continuously see the computer like uh, you know twitching different different pieces of that tape and what what's happening there i mean what's happening in the movie who knows but what's happening in real life in a mainframe computer is you're you're trying to seek to a particular part of the tape to find the data that's at that part of the tape so early software distribution was mostly on magnetic tapes like that that was the best way to do it um what happened when more personal computers started to come in was floppy disks which were uh, kind of magnetic disks. So, you know, magnetic tape made of ferrite. Um, you know, it's something like a, like a magnet, except that it's broken into these tiny magnetic domains. And those tiny magnetic domains can be, each one can be independently up or down. So that's how you store the data on the, on the tape or disk. You have these disks, and then there were different sizes and shapes of disks. I have many of them in my, in my possession now. Um, there were five and a quarter inch disks, which became sort of a standard for the early personal computers, particularly ones running the CPM operating system that was a sort of forerunner of, of Microsoft MS-DOS. Um, uh, uh, those were, and so a floppy disk was literally, you know, it's floppy. It had a sort of a, a cardboardish container and inside was this, um, uh, was this, um, um, uh, you know, typically brownish colored um, 
you know, magnetic ferrite thing that was was bendable. Um, so then what happened in sort of software distribution for personal computers was on floppy disks. And um, that really um, continued when, when Mathematica came out in 1988. Floppy disks were the medium of distribution for personal computers, initially the Mac, then later when PCs got powerful enough a couple of years later that one could run uh, Mathematica on PCs, uh, floppy disks were still the distribution medium. And so it's kind of a dramatic thing. You know, when we first um, uh, were, um, were making Mathematica, it was like, uh, I mean, today, when we finished a version of Waltham Language, literally, it, um, uh, you know, it's done, the testing is finished, we have a, a you know, a master copy, we pretty much just press go and people can download it. Actually, in modern times, it goes to a content delivery network, and so it takes a few moments to propagate out to the CDN, but then people can immediately download it. It's sort of an immediate thing. But back in the day, that wasn't how it worked. Back in the day, you would take it to a, a disk duplicator, and um, they would generate lots and lots of copies. So I remember, I think our disk duplicator was somewhere in Minnesota. Um, and I remember many different versions where we had deadlines, including the very first version of Mathematica. Somebody had to get on a plane with the master disk and go take it to the duplicator. And then they would, the duplicator would churn out copies and so on. And that would be the distribution medium for, the, for personal computers. For um, slightly bigger computers, um, workstation class computers, uh, usually these cassette tapes not cassette tapes like in a tape player, but bigger, crunchier um, sort of uh, cartridges um, were the thing which had tape inside them were the distribution medium that was used there. And, and there were many different standards. In other words, there weren't any standards really at all. There were lots of different incompatible, you know, a Sun workstation, an HP workstation, an Apollo workstation. They all used different kinds of tape. And so you actually had to separately copy the software onto those different kinds of tape. Um, the thing that happened in the floppy disk world is uh, three and a half inch floppy disks came in. The five and a quarter had been the standard for sort of the more professional workstation type things that were even bigger than five and a quarter inch floppy disks. I don't remember exactly what size. I remember one computer, um, actually, uh, the, the aforementioned Ed Fredkin was, was uh, for a while the CEO of this company, a company called Three Rivers Computer Corporation, that made a thing called the PERC, P-E-R-Q, which was an early workstation computer um, that uh, didn't in the end do that well. But um, it was it was kind of a um, kind of alongside the Sun workstation, the Apollo workstation, sort of at the same time, 1982-ish time frame. Um, and uh, um, it, for some reason I know, had very big floppy disks because I have a bunch of them. Um, and uh, kind of absurdly oversized floppy disks. Now, in terms of the packaging of these things, of how did you get, you know, what were they, what were they put in? You know, what did the things, what was the outer packaging? Well, actually, much of the outer packaging was really cruddy. I mean, like, for example, when you sent out tapes, there was no outer packaging. It was basically just in an envelope. And... Um, the tape itself would typically have like copyright information on it, and it would say uh, what um, um, what um, uh, uh, kind of you know what the software was, and so on. And, um, uh, and then, of course, there wasn't. It's not like it had a URL because there wasn't. The web didn't exist in those days. So if you wanted, you know, one would have to have actual booklets that were the installation booklets that came with these things. Now, I think. Um, in terms of kind of nice looking packaging, they were usually cardboard boxes. Um, and uh, like, for example, in early, uh, in terms of sort of professional software, most of the packaging was really crummy. And I think we kind of set some kind of standard with, with Mathematica of having a kind of actual designed, graphic design kind of art for packaging and graphic design and art for the labels on the floppy disks and so on. Um, and that was, uh, uh, that was now, you know, late 80s. There have been some, some, decent, some decent packaging. 
Now, another big part of the, the story, and, and actually I suppose this relates also to packaging, is in those days there were corner software stores and people thought that was the future. Just like there'd been bookstores and you know the local corner bookstore, so similarly there were the local corner software stores. And they were, they were companies like um, Egghead Software and, oh my gosh, what was the big chain of them? Ooh, Compu something or other. Um, I'm not sure. I don't remember. Um, and and the way that a lot of software was was sold is you would literally go into the software store and you would buy this box that was the software you wanted. And uh, as as a as a company selling to these organizations, it was um, uh, they were sometimes very squirrely organizations. They would have things like. You sell them stuff and it has a 90 day time to pay and they would routinely send back stuff at day 89 and reorder it at day 91 and things like this in order to avoid having to have any costs to carry the inventory, all sorts of squiggly things like that. I think Egghead Software was particularly, was famously the worst at that and a very, um, um, oh no, there was a, was it? was a chap who went by the name of Crazy Eddie, who was somehow involved with that. Maybe that was the same organization and who wound up in, in terrible legal trouble uh, uh, for various reasons. Um, but anyway, it was a very kind of weird, weird industry. Um, but uh, along with some very fine, um, what was it, CompuWare? Was that the name of one of the chains? I remember there was a, a, um, a lovely software store in Palo Alto, California, which was the the very first place um, where we we had uh, made the day that Mathematica was released, June twenty third, nineteen eighty eight. That was um, uh, sort of a place where it was going to be available, and literally we were like delivering the boxes, the you know big uh, sort of boxes of software to that place the night before, and so on. And then I think we had a an event there the the, the day after or something like that. Um, and so there were that was that was a, a, a sort of a single location store, as I remember, um, as opposed to these chains which came into existence. And then then the next big thing that happened was mail order software uh, stuff. And um, that's um, uh, yeah, that that was um, and obviously, by the time online delivery of software became possible after the web, I mean, online delivery of material was possible with FTP once the internet existed before the web existed, but that wasn't a common way to get uh, most kinds of software, um, at least commercial software. Uh, that was still very much of the, we'll send the tape in the mail, so to speak. Um, and uh, oh, various people commenting here, I remember installing WordPerfect using a set of three and a half inch disks. Yes, no, I, I think it, it <laughs> In the end, and this is where you know a technology is kind of losing it, the, the Mathematica distribution for uh, became like a 13-disc set. So in order, to, in order to load up the software, you'd be putting in 13 successive floppy disks. And, and people, yeah, the things went to double density, quadruple density, floppy disks. And, um, and then things went to CD-ROMs. And... Uh, and then to DVDs, and that was kind of the the next those next levels of evolution of, of software distribution. Another very funky thing I have to talk about this was um, software protection on floppy disks. So back when uh, when Mathematica was first coming out, there was a big campaign, there was big ads running everywhere. Don't copy that floppy, um, which was a, a an anti software piracy thing because it, it wasn't very well defined in those days, sort of what the story of intellectual property was for software and so on, and what was copyable, what wasn't. It really varied a lot from country to country. I think the US really turned the corner sometime in the probably mid to late 80s of people expecting that, you know, you wanted serious software, you would buy the software, et cetera. And I mean, at the time when uh, in the mid to late 80s, Microsoft and Borland were the two companies and they were kind of 
duking it out with different price points and so on. And Microsoft eventually won at a slightly higher price point and with different sorts of expectations. I think that, um, uh, but in, in other countries, there was, and in some countries there still is, you know, 98% software piracy and things like that, which makes it very hard to uh, have, uh, you know, much enthusiasm for making commercial software for such countries. And, and what happened in, in, in some countries is, as soon as there was indigenous software production, that really changed. It, I remember it changed in Japan, for example. As soon as there was a sort of indigenous Japanese word processor um, that had been produced in the country uh, and, and people were like, yes, we're buying it, it's from a Japanese company and so on. I think that things really turned around in, in that case. Um, in, uh, in other cases, it's, it's uh, well, we're still not there. Um, but anyway, back in the 80s, one of the issues was, could you just take a floppy disk and make a copy of it? And, and perhaps, you know, in those days, people had the idea that, well, you could just sell the floppy, you know, you could sell the copy. And uh, uh, because people didn't know about online distribution, there, there wasn't the issue of sort of online uh, you know, where, where it becomes rather much more trivial to copy things. Then people still had the idea. It's like a book. You could photocopy the book. Well, it was a lot easier to copy the data, the software data on a floppy disk and so on. And so there was this whole vast micro industry of copy protection. And so there were all these different schemes for copy protection. There were these so-called dongles where you would put a, a device onto your computer that had a unique ID, then you would call the software vendor for a for a a, a number to type in that would allow you to um, to run the thing. Or no, actually, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Dongles. You could typically run. You just had the dongle, and your computer, the software, would look for the dongle, and if it found it, it would run on that computer, and if it didn't find it, it wouldn't wouldn't run on that computer. Um, and then there were all these schemes where people would make actual physical changes to the floppy disks to prevent them from being copyable and so on. And then there were schemes that were more, more like today with activation codes and so on that, um, um, that, that were used. I, I will tell a story from the early days, this is what, early 90s, um, from Mathematica. One of our interesting uh, sort of protection stories was we had things set up so that uh, you'd get some ID code to run um, Mathematica on a particular kind of computer. But we'd also look at, look at the computer. And if the computer had certain characteristics, it wouldn't run. Or at least you had to get a different version to run on that computer. So for example, we had a version that was a US-based version. We had international versions. And we had versions that were, for example, suitable for Russian computers. Okay, so here's the story. Maybe I've told this on a live stream before, but it's a good story, so maybe it deserves being told again. So this was a time when the Mir space station was, you know, sort of up and about, and there was an American astronaut named Mike Fole, who um, uh, was a user, still is a user of Mathematica, Wolfram language, and so on, um, and uh, he uh, took. A a, 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 um, a laptop with um, with Mathematica installed to the Mir space station. Well, then there was an accident on the Mir space station. I believe that laptop wound up in space. Um, and uh, uh, but Mike, being a sort of an efficient astronaut, had kept a copy of a distribution disk somewhere else, separate from the from the laptop. And so, and at the time. The space station was was slowly spinning, and so the question was, how could you prevent the space station spinning? And Mike, again, being sort of an efficient, calm astronaut, was like, I know the equations of motion. I can just solve those differential equations in Mathematica, and I can work out, you know, what happens if we fire this thruster and so on. You know, how do we stop the space station spinning? So, uh, so gets out the distribution disk puts it in, the only PC he had available, which was a Russian PC that hadn't been pulled out into space, puts it in, it says, sorry, I won't run. This is a Russian PC. This wasn't a, uh, a version of, um, of, of Mathematica made for, for Russian PCs. 
So then our customer service team gets some call from some ground control person saying, you know, uh, what do we do about this? And it was it was a one of those, I think, interesting phone calls where it's like, um, uh, you know, where you get the call, which could be along the lines of, you know, the crocodile, a crocodile ate my my floppy disk, can you send me another one type thing? But this was a, uh, you know, there's an astronaut with a space station and, you know, the needs this thing to run. And it's like, just turn on the television and you'll see that this is a real news story. So, okay, that 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 all got resolved. And, and fortunately, we were able to, to give um, uh, give the ground control people the you know some different code to type in, and the thing ran on the Russian computer. And Mike managed to get quite a long way in solving the the equations of motion. Uh, I think the bad thing was that the Russian ground controllers, who were uh, kind of the people, you know, it was their space station, so you couldn't like break it. Um, were like, no, 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 just because you solve these equations and you say we can do this and this and this, that is not our procedure. You can't do that. You know, we must follow our procedures. And so the thing kept spinning for another day or so, but eventually their, their procedures were followed and, and all was well. Um, but so that was a that was a kind of an exotic story of, of um, uh, kind of the uh, copy protection of old. Um, it's a lot easier now. The uh, uh, you know you can download free Wolf Engine for developers or something and it doesn't doesn't um, doesn't ask you anything. Uh, let's see. Um, um, huh. Rab is saying that they came online so to speak when they needed two CDs for games and thought that was a pain, right? Um, Ah, yes. Aftershock says, I might be misremembering, but I think we put a piece of masking tape on floppy disks to prevent copy protection. Uh, I think what you're thinking of is on a floppy disk, there's a little slider that is the thing that determines whether the disk is writable or not. And I think if you, and so so you can kind of slide that to make a hole, and then the disk is not writable anymore. And I think people did copy protection stuff that was based on that that uh, sort of re, you know that write protection uh, thing on the physical disk. I think that's the um, uh, uh, that that's that's the kind of kind of thing. Um, a question here from Prab. Thoughts on internet pseudonymity and its history. It's interesting. I I you know. Okay, when I use the ARPANET which was the forerunner of the internet. And I started using that in 1976. Um, it had 512 hosts, I believe, all with numerical IDs. Many of those hosts were not publicly accessible. They were things like the North American Air Defense computer and so on. Um, they were, you know, you, would, you could get to a login prompt, but you didn't know a password. And um, that was the end of it. Um, but there were computers that were publicly accessible and um, one that I used a bunch was uh, the Project Mac, the multi-access computer uh, system at MIT. And um, that system had, uh, you had a login. And I remember when I went to that computer for the first time in 1976, using it over the ARPANET from England. Um, and you know, the ARPANET was, I used the ARPANET because I, I worked at a government lab in England, which had a connection to that. It wasn't like you could like dial it up from home type thing. Um, the, uh, uh, when I went to that computer, it said, you know, log in and it said, create a login. And so I tried to create the login SW because those are my initials. And it said, that's been taken. So I went and I created SWOLF Swolf instead. And that for many years was my, my, was my login. Um, but that computer didn't know me from anything. I mean, it didn't have any idea. I was a, you know, whatever, a 16-year-old kid in England. I didn't know. It. I doubt that it even logged. I, I very strongly doubt that it knew uh, sort of the originating address over the, over the internet, uh, over the ARPANET that any requests were coming from. So, you know, right then, I was anonymous. I mean, in, in uh, I don't think that 
my, no, I, I'm pretty certain that that computer never knew my actual name and never asked for it. Um, so, you know, that came very early. And I think the, um, the concept of kind of a, a handle independent of one's actual name was sort of forced on people by the technology because I don't know how, how many letters there could have been in my login, but not that many. And certainly there wouldn't have been spaces and things like that in the login um, at that time. And, uh, you know, I was just actually just found, um, because I've been doing this research on my own sort of history of the second law of thermodynamics, I found some email. I, I was a consultant at Bell Labs um, in 1983 ish time frame and interacted a bunch with the Unix group at that time. And uh, I found, um, I happened to find a piece of mail about random number generators actually that I had sent to somebody and somebody else had sent back to me. And one of the um, addresses on there was research exclam Ken. So at that time addresses didn't have their form of blah, 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 at blah, blah, blah. Although the at sign was already used back in the in the Project Mac computer, um, but for slightly different purposes, but along with the, along with usernames. But at that time, this was the UUCP system, the Unix to Unix copy program being used for email. And what you would see in an email address, like my email address at that time was um, uh, IAS exclam sun exclam swolf, I think, um, which IAS was Institute for Advanced Study exclam and exclam and then it was it was basically the routing of how you got where which machine you had to call up by phone to to send the message to next and so you would have these sequences of of uh, of, of descriptors for things um but anyway research exclam ken was ken thompson um who, who i knew back in, in those days um who was uh one of the creators of, of unix and and C, the c programming language um, and uh, actually, I'm remembering now, Joe Condon, who was another person involved in that group, I believe was a was somebody who had built a chess computer. He was also the person, I believe, who invented the touch tone dialing system. He was also a person who was very proud of having a machine that was some kind of referred to as sort of the black hole or something, which was a a machine where you could dial in where you could dial into it. I think. And it would dial out to a phone number, you know, any phone number anywhere in the world type thing uh, and, and not bill anybody for it. I mean, to be fair, that was at a time when, when um, uh, you know, the Bell Labs had created kind of the whole telephone switching infrastructure and these successive levels of ESS, the electronic switching system, whatever it was, you know, ESS 5, 6, 7. I think it had got to in those days ESS 7, which were telephone exchanges that would deal with 10 million uh, lines, and um, uh, so you know that that was the the, the folks who'd created that. Uh, I guess there was a version of Unix called Unix RT, the real time version of Unix, which was running on the on the whatever they were three B two, I think they were called computers that were in those telephone switches, uh, which were a kind of a, a custom made set of computers made by by um, uh, by Bell Labs. Um, okay, let me see. Uh, yeah, well, Prab is talking about phone systems and and, and blue boxes, and I think and, and things like this. You know, the thing was back in the day, in the eighties. You know, the only way you could sort of communicate with sort of the most powerful computer around, which was the phone system, was through dialing numbers and originally it was actually dialing with rotary phones then that sort of transitioned in the mm, late 80s i guess no 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 70s I, but by the time i was in the us which is 1978 i never had a rotary dial phone in the us i never had a touch dialing phone in england either so so i think they had come in in the us by by 1970 oh no 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 that's not right i had a I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I, I had a a um, my home phone. I got a um, uh, in those days you rented your physical phone from the Bell system, so to speak. And I got a I chose to get a touch tone phone um, as soon as I could. But I remember in a very retro kind of world, um, I remember dialing up 
the, the machine, the TIP, the terminal interface processor for the ARPANET um, on a rotary dial phone and then connecting through a modem, through an acoustic coupled modem, and then getting to the ARPANET, so to speak. So that was still a rotary dial phone. So I guess that they were still around in the late 70s. Maybe they disappeared in the early 80s. But you know, on a rotary dial phone, as the as the rotary dial clicks around, right, it, it just makes a bip, 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 a different number of bips for each different number as the dial turns around that amount to correspond to dialing. You know, that, that's why, you know, area code 212 is the area code for New York, because that's kind of the, the top area code, so to speak. And that was the area code that was fastest to dial. And if you were somewhere where the, the people who allocated area codes thought there wouldn't be much population, you would get, you know, the eight, whatever it was, area code, um, because that was a slower to dial area code. You know, Los Angeles got 213 and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those were the, the big population places got um, the... Uh, uh, the kind of the fastest area codes, like like San Francisco was 415. And that was a little bit, you know, downscale from, from the bigger population centers. Boston, I guess, even more downscale was 617. Uh, yeah, that's a terrible thing about old people like me is that that I actually remember area codes. Um, and when I see a number now, you know, it's it's like all numbers have been scrambled because everybody just has the cell phone from when they grew up somewhere or something. And so you can't tell anything from a phone number, but but I sort of have an instinctive, oh yeah, that's a, a Los Angeles phone number or something. But in any case, by the time, then there was touchstone dialing and you would be sending data through, you know, you're sending data to the phone system. And the question is, what can you actually send? And, and it was the case that that there were all these weird codes that you could type in that would sort of switch on and off different characteristics of the phone system and so on. Uh, I remember uh, this was a thing from, from actually from England. I remember this was 1982, January of 82, I think. Um, I was in England working on a software project and needed to transfer code to the US. And um, uh, it was a Sunday evening, I think. And um, I was, you know, had an acoustic coupled modem and I was trying to connect it and do a, a, a international call to a computer in the US um, to transfer this data. And it just didn't work, just didn't work. And, and part of the problem was in those days, it tended to be that there was sort of half duplex. That is um, uh, uh, only one person could be talking at a time type phone calls where, where the thing would... Um, um, oh, and, and that's right. And there was also echo cancelling, because what would happen is there would be something where you would say something, and then if there wasn't echo cancelling, somewhere at sort of the other end of the line, there would be sort of a, a an echo of that, and that would come back, and it would be very confusing. And so the um, in any case, the bottom line was the acoustic coupled modem could not handle sending data across a transatlantic phone call because the transatlantic phone call had all kinds of echo canceling and half duplex and all kinds of other things set. And so it was very frustrating. It's like, what are we going to do? And so I start calling you know, the operator because in those days you could just dial the operator um, and, um, uh, and some actual human would pick up. And so they dial the operator and say, I'm trying to make this transatlantic call and it doesn't work. And we're trying to do transfer data. The operator's like, I don't have any idea what you're talking about, but I'll transfer you to somebody else. I'll transfer you to somebody else. We got through three or four levels of people. And eventually we got some, some chap who was um, who was like, oh, yes. You know, I don't know whether he knew, you know, because they've been transferred through so many places. I have no idea whether he knew, you know, that it was a consumer versus an internal person at the phone system. I have no idea who he's talking to. He said, oh, yes, no problem. Just dial, you know, this, 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 some string of five numbers that will switch off the echo canceling and set this and this and you know route you over this kind of line should work there. They try it, it works perfectly. Uh, I think what, what became clear that person was actually sort of the chief engineer on duty at that time in England, sort of dealing with the phone system. And somehow we'd gone through enough, enough levels of, of, you know, take me to your leader, so to speak, that we reached that person who were just able to say, there's just this string of numbers you type in, and that will get you a line that will be appropriate for this kind of data transfer. I mean, who knows whether that was what sort of the official phone company usage was supposed to be, but but that was sort of a, 
uh, you know, that was how it worked, is that, is that you would dial some some complicated sequence of numbers. And I think in um, uh, I think there were lots of sort of um, uh, you know military type situations in the U.S. where it's like you know dial this number and dial the next string of fourteen numbers and you'll reach you know some person in um, uh, in some critical place at, in you know in the U.S. military infrastructure or something. Um, uh, I think that's some. Um, uh, but the other thing was that the billing mechanism was also based on these kinds of tones. And so these blue boxes that people made were things that would sort of fake out the billing mechanism uh, for the phone system and uh, let you make free phone calls and things like that. Um, ah, Cap is saying their father used to program on the EDSAC 2. That's really, that's before my time where you needed paper tape with holes to load the compiler, then your program. Absolutely. The first computer I used, absolutely, had I used paper tape. I still have a bunch of that paper tape. Um, it's uh, the computer I used, used eight hole paper tape, which was pretty common. Um, now the question is, because I've been doing this history about the second law of thermodynamics, I wrote a program in 1973 when I was 13 or whatever, that was one of my first big programs that was intended to do a simulation of molecules bouncing around, idealized molecules bouncing around. And I wrote that for a computer called the Elliott 903. And that, that, that program is, I wrote it on paper tape. I have a bunch of paper tapes. I don't know whether I have a copy of that program because I don't know what's on the paper tapes I have. And the question is, how do you read a paper tape in today's world? And so we've been looking around just in the last week or two for how do you read a paper tape? And uh, so far, we've determined that the Computer History Museum has a um, has a paper tape re reader. Um, but you know, it's to the point. You know, for example, nine track tape reader. We bought one of those off eBay a few years ago. But a paper tape reader, that technology in forty years, that technology is old enough that you can't you can't buy one of those off eBay. At least we couldn't find one. Um, and um, in fact, my best guess is the best way to read that paper tape is to just lay it out on, you know, lay it out in strips, photograph it and do image processing on it. Um, now for the particular paper tape I have, it has an extra wrinkle because I wrote the loader that I used for the paper tape, which was the thing that would take the, the, the data on the paper tape and load it into the memory of the computer. The computer I used, the way it worked is you would set, it had switches, toggle switches, and you would set an initial address that the computers, that was the initial value of the program counter or what in British English was called the sequence control register. You would set the sequence control register to a particular value and you set that on a bunch of toggle switches. Then you would press, I remember it was a, a button with a yellow light behind it. That was the jump button that you would press jump. And then the computer would start executing at the place in its memory where the program at the place in its memory that corresponded to the address you'd set on the toggle switches. And by default, the computer started, it had 8192 uh, words of memory and it had 18-bit uh, words of memory and its default initial location was at 8181. Actually, what it had was it had its so-called initial instructions, what would now be called its bootloader, was stored between 8181 and 8192. So I guess they were 11 instructions long. That was the default thing that the computer would do on um, on on starting, and um, the uh, the thing that um, uh, so you would okay so you press jump, and I guess you you could enter the 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 the, the, um, the address or that's right you would normally enter eight one eight one and it would start running its initial instructions for which it didn't need a tape. Otherwise, and those initial instructions, that's right, the initial instructions would start reading a tape through the optical tape reader. And um, that from the optical tape reader, it would get what it needed to start actually running whatever program you were trying to run. But what, what the first thing you would have to do is it would start just reading literally the beginning of the tape. But the next question was, how was the rest of the tape encoded after it had the initial loader at the beginning of the tape that said how to read the tape? How was the tape encoded? So one of the big problems with that computer was that it would be a tape punch where it would punch out the paper tape and it would get little pieces of confetti. 
and one would regularly get little pieces of confetti stuck in the holes of paper tape. It was particularly bad when there was mylar tape, you know, this plasticized tape that was for more sort of permanent programs. You could punch mylar tape as well as paper tape and the tape punch. And um, uh, mylar tape just would get static electricity and it would pick up um, pick up little, little, you know, pieces of confetti and so on. And every time it would pick up a piece of confetti, obviously the computer was just blindly reading the data that was on the tape. And so if there was a piece of, piece of confetti there, a bit would be wrong and your program wouldn't work. So it was kind of a nuisance. And it would be the case that, that the default loader, I believe, had a horizontal checksum where it would read the whole paper tape and it would have a binary uh, um, a check digit that was just taking you know, the, the even or odd number of holes that were supposed to be in the tape. So you'd read this whole paper tape and the paper tape would run through the, the optical tape reader. It wound up in a, in a, in a um, wooden bin on the side of the computer and it would be in a big mess. And one of the big sort of technical things you had to be able to do was take the end of the paper tape and there was a little rolling thing where you would roll it up and make it into a nice, a nice piece of paper tape again. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, but, but anyway, so it was super annoying because you would re read this whole giant program and there'd be some conf piece of confetti that got stuck in the tape halfway through and the thing would just read to the hook to the end and it would say, boom, it didn't work. Um, and, uh, uh, yes, my my scrapbook online has a picture of some paper tape that um, comes from that very um, very computer. Um, but in any case, the um, I, uh, as an enterprising thirteen year old or something, decided to write my own paper tape loader. And so I, I guess I invented what we call error correcting codes, and I thought it was kind of clever. It would it would read through and it would have these blocks, and there would be the um, uh, the actual data, and there would be um, it would be interwoven with in the way that error correcting codes work. It will be interwoven with the check information rather than the check information being all the way at the end of the tape. It was interwoven with the data, and so what would happen is if there was a piece of confetti there or something, it would just stop because it would find out it failed its error correction, it failed its its checking and error checking, and it would just stop in the in the tape reader. And so then what you would do is you would pull the tape back a few feet in the tape reader and then, you know, get rid of the piece of confetti and start it reading again. And so then I had this kind of clever scheme, which I now don't remember. It's full detail for resynchronizing the tape reading because you pull it back and obviously you're just pulling it some distance. You weren't, you didn't know how the thing was aligned. It wasn't like it was at the beginning of the tape. So I had some scheme for, for having it be able to auto auto determine where it was in the in the sequence. Okay, so this was I was I was pleased with my paper tape loader, and other people started using my paper tape loader as well. It's so probably my first um, distributed program because I sent it into the company that made the computer, and I think I think it ended up getting used elsewhere as well. Um, but uh, in any case, the um, the problem with my paper tape loader is that that means that it is not the case that I can just read the bit sequences off the tapes I have, they are encoded with my paper tape loader. I guess the loader is on the tape. So now that I think about it, if we have an emulator for the Elliott 903, we should be able to read what's on the tape actually. Um, but it means that we can't like just expect that it's plain uh, character codes for the characters, you know, if it was a source code program. So someone was asking, um, uh, um, how many lines of code was my my first simulation? I don't remember. I remember that the paper tape was um, not huge. It was maybe um, two or three inches across when you rolled it up. So I should work out how long it was. I, I think it never really worked properly, which is very frustrating. And I realized much later, I probably discovered some interesting phenomenon, but I had no idea what it was. And I, you know, I probably discovered the phenomenon of being able to make randomness from simple rules because I had sort of simplified the rules to the point where they were simple enough that I could program them in assembler language on this computer. Um, in any case, the, uh, okay, maybe uh, that was a long discussion of, of um, distribution 
things. And I, and I don't know, in, in, you know in, in the case of that computer, the way you would distribute software is you would um, uh, have a program, have a paper tape, you read it through the tape reader, and as it was reading, the tape punch was punching a copy of the of the tape. I mean, it's kind of interesting that these early computers was very physicalized, the, the production of a copy. It's very similar to what biology has to do, where again, it's, you know, you make a copy, it's very physicalized, you know, obviously with molecules that you're making another tape. Uh, and it is funny that, you know, the, the whole uh, DNA story and RNA story and ribosomes and things like that is it is quite strange that it's so similar to sort of our early computers because computers today, if somebody says, oh, you're encoding the program as a tape, it's like, you know, to a, a modern young person, it's like a tape, a tape, what is a tape? Um, a tape has nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what are you talking about a tape for a computer? I mean, it's, it's just got RAM and things like this. Um, uh, and it so happens that biology is using the kind of 1950s, 1960s style of encoding uh, information apparently on a tape. Now, I suspect biology isn't, that isn't the only thing biology is doing. I suspect biology is also storing information in these kind of dynamic networks of, of reactions and things, which are a different story, but that's for another day. Um, all right, let's see, maybe, maybe one or two more questions here and then should wrap up for today. Uh, um, let's see, Parker asks, how has the central hub of science changed geographically over time? And what are the reasons for the change? Well, depends what you mean by science. I mean, you know, it really helps to be able to write things down. So, you know, ancient Babylon, good place for science to start. The astrologers of ancient Babylon were sort of probably the first scientists and, you know, observing the heavens, looking at entrails of goats or whatever they were, um, you know, these were these were things where they didn't really know what was predictable, what was not. But that was kind of the very first sort of place of science. And Babylon was a big trading center. So it was a place where people came through there. I mean, I think that, you know, there are a lot more Babylonian scientific uh, tablets, for example, than there are Egyptian. I don't know of too many. In fact, I'm not even sure I know. Well, let's see, the Rhind papyrus, uh, which is an early example of kind of uh, mathematical exercises. That's an Egyptian thing. So maybe there was some amount of, um, of, of science in Egypt and math in Egypt. I think it was much more a Babylonian kind of tradition. It then really moved to Athens and the Greek tradition or the Athenian empire, so to speak. Uh, places like Alexandria in Egypt and so on were, were big when the, with the Library of Alexandria, people like Euclid worked there. Um, then, you know, the, the whole sort of extended Greek uh, civilization, you know, Archimedes in Sicily, things like this, that was, that was the next big place for science. And I think that there are civilizations that have more of an inclination towards kind of intellectual matters and learning and so on than others. And, you know, it then passed from there, sort of from Greek civilization that got kind of was sort of the the fancy stuff for the for Romans, although the Romans themselves were less interested, I think, in the science story. It was more kind of a Greek tradition that that survived within that that world. Then, you know, after the fall of the Roman Empire, um, the there were you know at the time there were all these books of of uh, Aristotle, Archimedes, all these kinds of people that were being passed down by copying. And that really passed to uh, uh, monasteries, and a lot of um, uh, and a lot of that knowledge got preserved in the Arab world, um, and uh, um, and then kind of I would say my impression is it reemerged in a somewhat distributed way. In you know there's a particular monastery here which has sort of kept this knowledge from the past when universities came on the scene, and universities were were kind of creatures of Western civilization. I mean, they were very, you know, in the 1200s when universities in Bologna and Oxford and, and so on, uh, sort of in Paris uh, started off, they were very uh, kind of, you know, for the training of clerics and things like this. It was kind of a, a Christian tradition 
kind of Western civilization story. Um, and that was, I guess, the, um, uh, you know, that was more a theology story, I think even not an, an alchemy and things story at the time. And I don't know when science, um, there was a lot of science that was, oh yeah, I mean, the other, the other big, big place for science by that time, by certainly by the 1400s was, was Italy, Pisa, Venice, things like places like that. These were merchant centers. Actually, even in 1200, Fibonacci in Pisa had um, uh, was, you know, that was a was a trading hub, and at a trading hub, people needed to compute things with money, and that meant that math was worthwhile, and you know, commerce was a driver of of certain kinds of scientific advance, and so I think that was some, um, you know, that that led to that. That and I think then probably one can really trace the the sort of the the hotbeds of science probably moved around with the hotbeds of commerce. I mean the Netherlands for a while, London, um, uh, these kinds of places. You know I think sort of the the uh, economic prosperity was was a big thing. I mean then you know it, it's a little hard to trace. Uh, well in in Europe we get to more modern times. And um, you know, there's a tremendous concentration of what is modern sort of science came out of the Western civilization tradition, which was very concentrated in Europe. Um, really, that's that's the place where it was happening. Um, I would say that the the sort of there was some amount of math that happened in India, China, etc., other places. But I would say that the 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 sort of the main thrust of what has become sort of the the current tradition of science is very pretty 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 western civilization oriented and certainly by the 1600s that was a story sort of pretty that was a a, a france germany england story of uh, of kind of the um uh the development of kind of mathematical science um i think by the time I mean, things kind of blobbed around. There were different traditions in different places. There was kind of in the 1800s, there was kind of the continental Europe tradition, and it was ahead in some ways, and there was the British tradition, and it was ahead in other ways, and these kind of blobbed around for a while. Um, I think then uh, uh, kind of the, um, uh, you know, for a while, late 1800s, I mean, in different fields, I, I think, you know, my impression is Germany, for example, was very big in things like chemistry, physics. Um, England maybe had, um, well, let's see. I mean, uh, it just, you know, there were there were lots of things being done in different places. I think that, that a lot of, uh, one question was how were people doing these, these things like science? Because most people didn't do it as a profession. Most people did it because they were had another means of support, they were independently wealthy. They had some other business running. Um, it was, uh, you know, and so it was done by those kinds of people, or they were part of a court somewhere. They were part of, uh, you know, they were advisors to a court or whatever else. And that, so that sort of depended on on how those things were set up, and whether you know the king at the time was interested in. Uh, you know, in having science folk around or not. And I think that, you know, that led to a lot of sort of detailed, um, you know, motion of scientists. I would say that the the thing that allowed science to be pretty itinerant for a long time was that, well, most learning was written in Latin and Latin was kind of a universal language of learning known to the folks who were doing that. And that finally started to disintegrate in the 1600s and that's what led people like Leibniz to be so keen on inventing mathematical notation, because he saw that as a way to, to sort of keep mathematics at least coherent between different countries and not sort of fragment it across things written in, in English or, or German or whatever else. And I think that, um, uh, you know, that, that was a thing that probably more regionalized um, science, um, although it it is the case that the sort of diffusion time for people is long compared is, is short compared to the time scale for substantial changes in science, and so that's tended to mean that there has been mostly sort of one worldwide worldwide science 
rather than a lot of fragmented pieces. I say that, but but for example, during the Cold War, there was at least a certain amount of divergence between sort of Soviet, let's say, physics and American physics, although with a lot of um, you know effort to knit those together by having Soviet journals translated into English, and I suspect American journals translated into Russian, though I don't actually know that. Um, and and so I think, um, uh, yeah, that that's 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 been a a thing there. Um, the um, uh, let's see. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just noticed a question here from Harry. Do you know if there's ever been a copy protection scheme for paper tapes? No, there won't have been, because, well, I say that, I say that, I say that. Um, you know, people certainly put commercial data on paper tapes. I don't think anybody worried about it at that time. And I know uh, some friends of mine from, from high school who were um, had all kinds of sort of computer security exploits that they did on the computer that, um, that we have that was this paper tape based computer. And I think it involved uh, what would now be called sort of dumpster diving of finding sort of pieces of paper tape that have been discarded and so on that had data on them. So I, I think in those days, people didn't think about that. I mean, I don't think the idea of encrypting a paper tape, for example, was completely, to me at least at the time, was utterly unknown. Um, I think people, when they would do commercial, okay, so related to paper tapes were telex machines, which used usually five-hole paper tape, which were things where you would basically dial on the phone and the paper tape was just a way of sending your data through more quickly. So you wouldn't be sort of sending a telegraph type message at the moment when you'd already connected on the phone line. Um, now, telex machines, um, they didn't use codes like that, but they did have commercial codes. And what would happen is companies would have these code books and it would be code words. And so people would translate, you know, it would say, you know, uh, the fish is in the ocean or something. That translates into, you know, there'll be a shipment that will arrive in this place at that time or something. But not enough data there. But but they would have these code books that would be a way of sending sort of encoded messages um, in that kind of very, very straightforward kind of fashion. And, and I think on telex machines, people may have used, uh, possibly... They may have used things like Caesar ciphers or Vignette ciphers, where where you're basically just saying, you know, to every letter A, you know, to every letter, add six to the position of the letter, or add six to this letter, and six plus two, six plus two plus two, et cetera, to, to successive letters. Um, let's see, Philip observes, there's a link between tra training clergymen, the original role of most Western universities, and the growth of early modern science. Uh, for sure. I mean, that was the that was the reason people thought universities should exist. I mean, later on, there were law schools, medical schools, things like that. I think, you know, that the whole question of what's education for has been uh, something that is kind of uh, sort of, I think, gets to be important in modern times. But public education, like K through 12 education, you know, it's like train people so they can join the army, train people so they can be part of a democracy. Those are uh, train people so they are suitable to work in factories in the Industrial Revolution. These are kind of the origins. Well, that was sort of the origin of K-12 education. But university education was a much more elite business. I mean, you know, even when I was, and I'm not that ancient, but even when I was in high school in the early, 19, early to mid-1970s um, in England, uh, you know, I went to this very fancy high school called Eton, and... Um, there were, I don't know what fraction of kids were going to college from there at that time, but I would guess was on the order of two thirds. So, and I, and I think a little bit earlier, it was on the order of maybe a third or a quarter. Now, the people who were in the, the kind of the, the King's Scholars crowd, which was the sort of the, the scholarship kids who were the more academic crowd of which I was one, um, my guess is that a much larger fraction of those people, probably close to 100%, went on to university, but of the of the other folk, the so-called oppidans, the people of the town, so to speak, um, who were not part of the the um the sort of the 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 original thing endowed by the 
King Henry the, oh my gosh, sixth maybe, um, the, uh, in 1450-ish, no, 14, oh, I don't remember, that of that, oh, yeah, 1450-ish, I think. Um, but uh, of those people, the, you know, in England at that time, uh, you know, I would say a minority probably went on to college, but in the 1960s, probably a minority of the non-scholarship kids went on to college. And what did they do? They uh, went to what was usually called manage the family estates. They went to join the army. Uh, they went into uh, various kinds of, uh, of family businesses and so on, which were trade businesses or whatever else. And going to college was sort of this irrelevant intellectual kind of thing. It only became, you know, it's only in very recent times that sort of this universal college, or it's not really universal even now, but this, this much more, much broader sort of uh, uh, use of college. And I, I suppose in the, in the US, it probably came in, maybe came in after World War II with the GI Bill and things like this. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and, you know, it is a good question that, you know, what is the role of these different forms of education in society, what's the role of the universities? I think the idea that universities are a place where research happens is kind of a, was a sort of, was always an add-on. It was always like, it's mostly about teaching, but by the way, people do research too. And then government funding of research came in in the US in the 1930s and 40s, I think. Um, and, uh, and and big time after uh, the 1950s. Um, and that sort of uh, put together a bunch of the sort of research function, the teaching function. I mean, it's a good question whether universities should have and do have as their mission, the preservation of knowledge from generation to generation from the 1200s on, or whether the universities have the mission to you know create new knowledge and feed the new stuff to the next, to the kids who are there, what it is. I mean, I, I tend to think that there is a great value to preserving the knowledge of our civilization um, and that uh, it's kind of a mistake. And well, here I am doing a live stream about history. So obviously uh, we all believe somewhat in, in the value of history. Um, and uh, uh, it's, you know, I, I tend to think that's, that's a part of the mission. And I think for a long time in the history of universities, that really was seen as the mission was, was just the, 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 the sort of the preservation of knowledge across across generations and so on. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm being asked here from Spare about thoughts on different methods of storing information in terms of resilience over long time scales. You know, I I keep on being asked this because I I, I make use of a lot of historical archives, and so archivists uh, who know I'm in the tech business will say, hey. You know, it'd be really great if you guys could make a better archiving system. Yeah, we're going to try and do that because I'm going to try and do that for my own archive and hopefully we'll make something that other people can use too. But people ask, you know, how should they store the data? And my statement is the only data that I've been able to consistently keep alive is data that's been in online storage. Anything that's off on a tape, a disc, a, you know, a quartz crystal thing, I don't know how to read that stuff. Like I'm talking about paper tapes and that's a 40 year span. And I don't know how to read the paper tape 40 years later. So big lose if I put the stuff on paper tape. Um, I have to say that things that are on paper, which can be scanned, those have done okay. It's like I, I know uh, uh, something, a uh, random fact about medical records. If you look at... Um, uh, the U.S. Army, for example, the medical records from World War II, which were all kept on paper, are alive and well. The medical records from the Gulf War, I'm told, are kind of non-existent because they were on computers. And the computers were, when they came back from the war, the computers were wiped. And so it was not as robust a storage method as just stick it on paper, put it in a, uh, you know, put it in... Um, uh, you know, put it in some storage facility somewhere. So I tend to think that, um, I mean, I, I've had the experience of reading um, magnetic tapes, discs and so on from 40 something years ago. I 
think we've usually been able to do it. I don't think the magnetic, um, I, I don't think they've been demagnetized over that period of time. So I think that's been okay. The main problem is the format and uh, and just the physicality of how do you read a, you know, a cassette tape for a Apollo domain computer or something or whatever they were called. Is that the name? I forget. Um, from 1983, well, it's not easy to do that. Uh, you know, there has to be a sort of a chain of things that involves, you know, reconditioned machines bought off eBay type thing. So, you know, I, I think that um, in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, other things where in principle you could read it, you know, I think things that have been etched into various kinds of materials, in principle, you will be able to read it. Um, is it easy to read? No, the only stuff that's easy to read is the online stuff. I mean, there's an interesting wrinkle on this with blockchains because you know, a blockchain has the feature that in order to, you know, when you put new things onto the blockchain, in order to validate the new things, the whole of the rest of the blockchain has to be valid. And so in a sense, those who add want to add new things to the head of the blockchain have to, or the tail, the modern tail of the blockchain or something, have to be maintaining the head. They have to be maintaining the earliest blocks in order to maintain the integrity of the hashes that they get for their modern blocks. So blockchain is an interesting case. It's a kind of pay it backwards type situation where the people who are adding now and sort of putting effort into uh, doing things on the blockchain now are necessarily preserving the data that was put onto the blockchain earlier. So it's an interesting kind of model for sort of uh, forced preservation. Of course, that assumes that the blockchain doesn't just go completely belly up and people don't just forget about it. Um, and uh, you know, the number of copies of, of blockchains is not very large. I mean, it's maybe thousands at most, um, and, and some are much, much smaller than that. So it's not the case that it's like, oh, we will be able to find this and we'll be able to find it forever more. I mean, I would say that the, um, uh, you know, in my own experience um, of, uh, of archived material, yeah, I mean, one of the problems is you, sometimes you have uh, archive tapes. We don't usually store all the diffs. In fact, we're just trying to work out a better scheme right now to basically, we have a bunch of archive tapes and they're daily, weekly, monthly backups. And it's a question of kind of um, aligning those properly. Um, all right, I should wrap up um, in a moment here. Um, uh, Harry is commenting that um, from Babylonian times, uh, cuneiform was preserved because it was stamped on clay tablets. They say all the good stuff, science, poetry, was written on material like hides and papyrus that didn't age well. I actually um, uh, didn't know that. Um, there is a decent amount of math and in, in uh, cuneiform tablets, there's a decent amount of mathematical tables, and there is a uh, yeah. There's certainly exercises done because the scribal schools in ancient Babylon were, I believe, teaching people to to um, to write on on clay tablets that were soft at the time when they were being you know when they had a little you know wooden styluses that they were using in them, and then they they baked them in the sun. I, I was I was not aware of a sort of a a, a, um, uh, a non-surviving track there that might have existed. Um, SS is commenting that the Dutch East India Company has records on paper that exist from the 1600s and 1700s. Yeah, I mean that you know you go look in the British Museum, for example. There's all kinds of interesting documents that are sitting right there that come from that period of time. I think I think in the you know I think the legal cases in England are still extant from that period of time. I know I have a friend who's a, I think, a fifth generation lawyer in England. And he was very proud um, a few years ago that he got to cite a precedent from like the 1300s. And I'm kind of thinking that that precedent must have existed on paper somewhere in some, uh, uh, in some archive somewhere. Otherwise, it wouldn't really, otherwise nobody would know that case law precedent. Um, Well, let's see. I think I should probably wrap up here. Is there anything else on this, these topics that I could maybe um, talk about a little bit? Um, Aaron is asking about um, uh, access to scientific data and its sharing over time. 
you know, scientists are usually pretty bad at sharing their data and always have been. I think my own efforts at providing sort of open code and so on and, and having a, a uh, I mean, look, in the, in the past, yeah, sharing has not been a, a strong suit for a lot of scientists. I mean, when the solution to the cubic equation was coming in in 1500 or so, there was this whole giant uh, sort of flap about the fact that this, uh, you know, between Cardano and Ferrari and and I forget the names of all these other people who had, who claimed, you know, I have the solution to the cubic. I can demonstrate it to you. I can solve a cubic in front of your eyes, but I'm not going to tell you what the formula is. That, that's been a thing forever and ever and hasn't changed. And, you know, when people have say, oh, there have been all kinds of efforts in the US for federally funded research, for example, for people to put their data online, to make their data available. Yeah, well, um, we've been involved in some of those efforts. And the sad thing is that people you know, will usually just say, well, here it is. It's like a, like a legal filing of some kind. It's a big mess and it's really quite unusable. I mean, one of the things with Wolfram Language and this thing we call the, our data framework is we actually have a representation of all these different kinds of things in the world, whether it's a geolocation or a species of animal or whatever else. We have a standardized representation of those things. And once you have data that uses that in our computational language, then you can actually get to use it in lots of other places. And so we've gone to some effort to make our data repository be something where you can, once you have data in the data repository, and it takes some effort to get it into that sort of computable form, then there's a chance to use it elsewhere. And, and then it really becomes a seriously useful thing where you can actually make use of the data elsewhere. But most of the time, with, with notable exceptions, I mean, there are, there are lots of government agencies in the US, NASA being one of them, and IH is another one where, where there are big data sources, uh, Federal Reserve is another one, where there are sort of big standardized data sources that are highly useful and, and well, well accessible, so to speak. You know, I think the, uh, the main story of this has to do with, in the US, uh, sort of from the get-go, a lot of data was sort of the government, you know, whatever it is, by the people, for the people or something. It's like the government data is going to be accessible from the census data to lots of other things. It was very much a US driven concept to have sort of accessible government data. In other countries, absolutely not that same tradition. I mean, I, you know, I could tell you many stories in the UK, for example, oh, a, a good example, um, uh, the Ordnance Survey, the, the mapping agency in the UK, um, you know, it always said its maps are copyrighted and they're crown copyright and, you know, they're not copyable. My friend Steve Coast, back whenever it was, 20 years ago or something now, um, decided to have this project called Open Street Map, where he got people to make uh, kind of by, you know, uploading their GPS data and so on to sort of make um, open maps of, as it's turned out, the whole world. And as it's turned out, that's the, the foundation that's used for, for lots and lots of mapping that's done around the world. But that was a consequence of the fact that in the UK, uh, you know, the maps, the standard government maps were considered um, uh, copyrighted. I mean, I remember back, um, when was it, about 12 years ago or something now, we were trying to use British tide tables, which were, you know, copyright the Admiralty. And then there were tide tables, which they were considered secret. And it was just a whole a very different attitude towards data and data sharing from, from governments other than the US government. I mean, there's been, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, even in the European Union, uh, different approach. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there where in the US, the data is free. In the European Union, it's, it's quite expensive data. Um, that uh, is not not prop not um, not not readily available. It's an interesting trade-off, um, and uh, um, um, that's. Uh, but I think um, um, 
you know, the challenge of open data is it's really no good to have something like my paper tape. You know, it's it's got to be data in some computable, understandable, transferable form. And as I say, a bunch of our technology is kind of, I think, the, the most advanced in terms of making that possible. Um, but uh, that's a different story. All right, I should wrap up and uh, go back to my day job here. Um, and uh, thanks for asking all kinds of interesting things. And um, I look uh, forward to uh, being with you again on another, another live stream. Uh, well, I'll be doing another one of these in two weeks and um, my other one on Friday, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, uh, thanks for joining me and uh, bye for now.